Welcome to the Divorce Podcast, a podcast that aims to address divorce separation and co-parenting here in the UK, countering the often sensationalist way it's portrayed in the media, challenging the status quo and driving for reform. On each episode, I'm joined by experts to discuss divorce, separation and co-parenting from different angles and to give their opinions and to debate them. I'm Kate Daly, a relationship counsellor and divorce coach, co-founder of Amicable, the divorce services company and host of this divorce podcast. Today, I'm joined by Cecilia Corbetta and Judah Rasham from Place to Be. Place to Be is a children's mental health charity with over 25 years experience of working with pupils, families and staff in UK schools. Their mission, quite simply, is to improve children and young people's mental health. Place to Be's vision is for all children and young people to have the support they need to build lifelong coping skills and to thrive. Cecilia is Regional Clinical Lead for London and West. Cecilia joined Place to Be in 2003 and holds national responsibility for parent work. She's a BACP accredited counsellor and clinical supervisor with over 17 years experience delivering counselling, therapeutic services and supervision within schools and in private practice. Judah is programme leader for family work. Judah is also a BACP registered counsellor and parent training mentor and he joined Place to Be this year in 2021. He's over seven years experience delivering counselling and therapeutic services for adults and children. Judah has been supporting parents and carers, delivering parenting training and supervising parenting practitioners within local authorities and the NHS for over 17 years. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Let's start, if we may, with a little bit of background. Tell me a little bit about Place to Be, Cecilia. What, what does it do? So Place to Be is a children's mental health charity. So we work in schools and we support children, young people, parents and staff as part of a whole school approach to mental health. It means that we work with not just the children, but those significant adults in their lives to create mentally healthy communities within which children can grow and thrive. So are you a consulting service then? Do you go in for a period of time and come out or do you tend to stay in schools once you're in there? We do stay in school and this is what makes the service so effective. So we are school based. We are easily accessible and non-stigmatizing. So it's place to be becomes just like part and parcel of school life. So, you know, it's 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 a service that children and parents and staff can access at any point. And it it helps strengthen the mental health of the whole community, not not Mm -hmm. just the children. Mm-hmm. And very school based. Yeah, school. So it's all about the, the point of entry being school, then children at school. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we also provide a lot of training to teachers and school staff, again, to increase understanding of children's mental health. So mm-hmm. that we do to schools that don't have the full school service, you know, where we have counselors in schools working directly with children and families. Okay. And Judah, what sort of activities do you undertake? What do you do with children? Well, there's um, different aspects of the service which are more focused around delivering services for children within school, like one-to-one counselling. Mm-hmm. But there's also support that's offered to parents um, within the school, like parent partnership, where um, practitioners support parents with everyday kind of signposting or support that they might need. And there's also um, other group work that's done within schools for children. Most of the schools that would, would deliver that might have practitioners that are trained in that particular intervention to deliver a kind of group work intervention for those children. But also now with family work, we've got more interventions which are more universal for parents, like our Parenting Smart website, where they can access information on variant in parenting t- kind of challenges that they might face. Um, so that's a kind of universal thing. And then we have more targeted support for parents in the form of something called PIPT, which is more of a kind of intervention which is focused on supporting parents with children with conduct problems. So if they have a specific conduct issue, mm-hmm. parents might receive support, you know, on a more one to one basis over a 10 week kind of program mm-hmm. uh, where they where they take part with their child in school. And also what we're, we're delivering, aiming to deliver in the new year is an online parenting course. We're currently in the kind of 
gone last bit of writing the, the parenting course we're, we're in consultation with um slam who are south london mostly helping us to deliver that to kind of get that course ready to release in january 2022 and that will be available for parents within the particular cohorts where place to be schools are delivering our services and those parents can sign up for those online courses and those are a bit more flexible so parents can sign up for that you know register onto the course and then complete that course over eight weeks so there's a whole range of different services that are delivered from place to be. Sounds great. And um, one of the things that we're sort of interested in on the podcast is the experience of children going through divorce and separation. So I wonder if I can ask maybe Cecilia, what happens to a child when parents decide that they're no longer going to stay together and, and separate or divorce? Talking about their emotional experience, you know, this is something okay, that we hear about a lot in our work. Mm. So, you know, what tends to happen is uh, we, we all know that a divorce or, or a separation is a very, very stressful and very emotional mm. experience for children. When you think about it, separation and divorce, you know, some of the feelings that might emerge are similar to what you might experience when you're going through a bereavement. Mm. You know, it, it entails a significant, a significant loss and some of the feelings might be the same. So for some children, it, it can feel as if the whole world is being turned upside down mm. and it can be very, very, very traumatic. They might feel shocked. They might feel uncertain. They might feel confused and angry. Many might also be blaming themselves and mm. feeling as if they're fault. I'm reminded of um, a child that I used to work with when I was um, working as a school counsellor in, you know, as part of my previous role in place to be. And um, and this particular boy started to, you know, to develop some behavioural difficulties at home, you know, becoming quite aggressive and getting into trouble in the playground. And the school was aware that there was some difficulties, you know, at home. So he came to me for a one-off session and he wouldn't say anything. But I was very aware of what was going on at home. And at some point I wondered out loud whether, you know, perhaps in his mind, you know, he had some worries about home. And I said something like... Um, Gosh, I know that, you know, for some children where their parents are not getting on very well or they're thinking of splitting up, some children might actually think it's their fault. And this boy who hadn't seen, hadn't uh, hadn't said a single word and was actually being, you know, quite difficult and defiant in school, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. burst into tears and started crying. And then went back to class and and, and the teacher said, actually, you know, they, 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 something has, has, has really moved for this mm. child, you know, they, 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 because you were able to give voice to something that was clearly really upsetting him and he couldn't put into words mm -hmm. so that's that's often the struggle for a lot of children you know, they find it really difficult to verbalize you know to explain right. in words mm -hmm. you know what's going on for them internally but we know that behavior is is, is a communication mm -hmm. and therefore you know by looking at their behavior and whether there have been any changes in their behavior we might be able to tell you know what, what's going on for them within internally mm -hmm. and whether it is to do with um you know feeling unsettled feeling overwhelmed feeling scared or worried or anxious about the future, all feelings mm. kind of connected to, you know, to, to, to separation and divorce and the experience of loss. Okay, so it's that worry, that anxiety, and um, the tendency to blame that are really the big issues. Very much so. And the confusion and the uncertainty. Mm. You know, a lot of parents, you know, there is this kind of misconception that, you know, that so long as we don't argue in front of the children or the conflict is not kind mm. of overt or out in the open, then the children will be oblivious to it. But actually, and I'm, 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 sure, that will, I'm sure that they will back me up in a lot of our work, we hear otherwise. You know, the children are very attuned to what goes on, you know, around them. Mm -hmm. And even when the parents are careful not to argue in front of them, you know, the, the children do pick up on, you know, the energy, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, the emotional, you know, anxiety, you mm -hmm. know, within the home. And for some of them, then, you know, they act out, you know, they externalize it, you know, in their behavior. And some of them hold it in. Mm. And, you know, they tend to blame themselves or become more with, withdrawn or more depressed or more anxious. You, you might notice some kind of regressive behaviours, you know, they might start, to, you know, to wet the bed or, you know, show their distress in another way. But nonetheless, you know, the, the, that kind of anxiety, it's taken up, you know, and, and taken on by, you know, the children, even when the conflict is not overt and mm. they're exposed to it. And so, Judah, what sort of interventions can you do to help children when they're struggling with those emotions that Cecilia has described? Yeah, I think about what Cecilia was saying about, you know, children not being able to verbalise or put those those internal feelings into a, into a, a kind of verbal um, communication. We, mm -hmm. we need to offer children space to do that in a different way sometimes. Maybe, you know, if, for example, you know, through one-to-one -one therapy, creative therapy for children, that sometimes becomes a really nice vehicle 
for them to allow some of those feelings to come out. I mean, working with a young boy who had, you know, not seen his dad for a long time and there was um, separation difficulties that, and, and that kind of an issue around contact for the dad mm-hmm. as well. And he would come to creative therapy with me and what he would do is in the sand tray, he would bury certain people, you know, and then um, create, you know, lots of kind of structures around it. And, and when I talked to him about it, he would say, you know, that that person's buried and they can't get out. And, and you know, I'd like them to get out of the sand and I want, I want to see them. So it's almost like some of that mm. stuff that he couldn't put into words around how he was feeling around his dad would come out through that play within the sand. And so I think that there is, there is lots of ways that we can offer children, especially creative ways to give them that, that vehicle of mm. expressing what is, is, is deeper down for them but I think parents as well you know just being able to offer kind of really low level spaces where kids can just talk freely about what they're feeling and giving them that message that that is okay because I think sometimes you know children might not always feel that they are okay to say certain things maybe even if it's related to you know a partner who is no longer living with them then they might feel well, I can't talk about that partner so I guess it's right. one of the things we can do as parents is to allow children to know that it's okay for them to verbalize things like that to us and that you know that that we're we're a listening ear and then just creating spaces where we just do that kind of listening anyway you know through play you know just connecting in play collecting in activities doing things that are you know give us more time as intimacy and and connection as parents with children I think those things just create those moments where, where kids then say things that are deeper down because when we ask questions of children, sometimes they clam up. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, it's not <laughs> actually the, it's not actually the way to go most of the time. It's that classic thing, isn't it? You know, where parents pick up the child from school and start asking them a ream of questions. Yeah, how was your day? And, yeah, and children just don't say anything or they say, I don't know. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's just a natural kind of thing that sometimes happens. So I think we can create a, a more space where, where children can just do that by even noticing things about them by saying, oh, you know, oh, I notice you're, you're a bit um, quiet today. You know, that might just open up a child to say, oh, yeah, I'm quiet because of this. You know, I think yeah. it's just thinking of those ways where we can create more platforms for children to feel free with expression. And I think parents can be a good role model of that as well. So being a role model of talking about feelings yourself. So you may not talk about feelings related to what's going on with you and your partner, because that's not what you really want to express with the children, but you might express other things about feelings. You might say, oh, you know, today I felt really, really scared about getting to an appointment when I'd get there on time today. And you know, what I really did that helped me is I sat down, took five minutes to breathe and just think about it. And that really helped. Those kind of communications for children to hear us saying that really useful because then they start to use that same model. Language, to, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of how to yeah. manage the emotions. So those kinds of things are, are, are really useful for kids, I think. That are. So just picking up on that, as parents, if we are in that scenario where we're going through the separation or divorce and it's difficult for us, mm-hmm. are there some kind of top tips or things that we can do during that really heightened emotional time when perhaps we're not at our best. What can we do to protect our children? Because obviously we might be hurting as parents, but we still want to be able to help our kids. And I know that lots of people carry a tremendous sense of guilt Mm. and shame and all sorts of quite unhelpful (laughs) emotions with them when they are separating from a partner. So as parents, when we're in that really dark place, what can we do to help protect our kids? Because I guess that's going to help us feel better and a bit more in control if we know at least we are being able to still be good parents. Mm. Interestingly, I was going to say, one of the um, things that we know from what children say to us, like um, there's a pocket guide around what most children say when they're parents are going through some separation and one of the things they said is they can get on with their lives if parents get on with their lives so it's Mm -hmm. almost like you know we can cope if we can Mm -hmm. see you are coping too Mm -hmm. and I think that's the thing is that it's that kind of taking care of yourself as a parent um idea as well because if if children can see that that parent is taking care of themselves in the way of you know managing their own emotions or getting the support they need or doing the things that they enjoy that are going to help them feel better about themselves then it it helps that child again to see okay so you're able to get through this I'm going to be able to get through this with you because you're you're the model for me on how to get Mm -hmm. through this so I think that comes to mind straight away about you know what kids say that you know they might feel a lot of range of emotions but you know as long as they can see that you're dealing with those emotions and getting on with your life then they can do that too. 
Yeah, I think sometimes we're scared, aren't we, that children can't cope with emotions, <laughs> whereas we just all have to cope with emotions, yeah. don't we? So role modelling, coping strategies, always a, always a good thing. Cecilia, what about the warning signs? So you can be helping your child and it can be sort of progressing. You can be talking about emotions, but are there some signs that a child isn't coping when you might need to get some additional help? Absolutely. And, you know, the, the, our belief is that parents know their children best. So they are mm. best placed to notice any significant changes in their child's behavior. Now, we know that children are likely to be affected as we are as adults, you know, going through a separation or divorce, mm-hmm. you know. So, you know, experiencing sadness and, you know, and a range of difficult and sometimes overwhelming emotions is perfectly normal, you know, for adults and children. So as Judah was saying, I think it's really, really important to make space for their sadness, you know, to allow it, you know, to recognize it as, you know, a part of the process. But there is a point, you know, at which parents might think, actually, this is turning into something mm. more concerning, you know, and they, and, and my belief is that parents are best placed to know where their point is mm. because they know, you know, they know their child best. So if they get to a point where, for example, they notice significant changes in their child's mood or their behavior or eating or sleeping patterns, and they think actually, you know, that this is something that needs, you know, more attention. That's the time to speak to the school, speak to a GP or to a mental health professional, even just for reassurance. Mm. And the same is true of adults. The same is true of adults, as you said, Kate. I mean, divorce is a very, you know, it, it, it entails a huge amount of, you know, of, of loss, you know, for adults too. And that can affect our own mental health. Mm. So, you know, we also think it's very, very important for parents to prioritize, you know, their own emotional well-being so that they can remain fully available, you know, to support their children. And they also model, you know, positive kind of health, you know, or help-seeking behaviours. You know, Mm. it's absolutely normal, you know, to look for help if you're struggling with overwhelming emotions. And this is what adults and children can do safely. And is there, within school, so if a child is struggling, is school the place to go and talk about that first? Because not everybody might have a school counsellor or I presume you're not in every single school. So how do people access help for their children? We hear such horror stories of there being waiting lists that are years long um, to get you know, CAMs involved, for example, or to get child access to child mental health in the community. What can people do if they're faced with a child that needs help and they're struggling to get help? Yeah, I think that is a real, real difficult concern for many parents now. I think one of the things that is useful, I guess, now, for, like for us with on place to be on the website we've we've created a website specifically for things like that so that parents can go on a website such as parenting smart and look for support you know put in the thing that you're kind of concerned about and there's lots of topics that are covered on there and we, we also have signposting to other agencies on that site that you can then right. find more help because they, i mean there is a range of charities and and third sector kind of agencies that will support families but it's not always you don't always know where to go you don't yeah. always know who to ask and i think that's a really really difficult thing and area to area it's different you know some charities and certain support operate in one area and in another area it wouldn't be there so I think if you can find kind of you know hubs where you can find some of that information that's the real place to start and and sometimes even if it's not in the local school it might be through the local authority so some local authorities have family support hubs within areas you can go to your local family support hub there and talk to people that are in those places to, to find what the support would be most relevant for you Or even, you know, through local health services usually do have some signposting ability, Mm -hmm. you know, to give you some um, sense of what's in the area that you can access. It's just about knowing what's in your area, because as as I said, I think there is a lot out there. I mean, the the kind of well-known charities like the NSPCC give lots of information and and places like that, you know. So you you might, if you're not sure at all where to go, you might go to those well-known kind of names first and look at to what they might have Mm. in local areas after that so do you think parents should be talking to the school about you know things that are going on at home so if you're going through a separation or divorce do you I'm gonna say recommend that's gonna make you all feel uncomfortable isn't it do you recommend that parents talk (laughs) talk to the school I think it is an individual decision but you know as part of our approach we believe it in making sure that all significant adults in a child's life are working together 
yeah. you know, to make sure that the child is supported and held in mind. And what comes to mind as we were having this conversation is the idea of resilience, you know, very much. Mm. So the idea that all adults involved in a child's life have a role to play in boosting, in fostering kind of resilience within that child and, and, and therefore promoting good mental mm. health. So with that in mind, you know, I think it would be very appropriate to speak to, you know, to, to, to a trusted adults within the school, you know, the mm. class teacher or the special education needs coordinator, or if there is a particular adult that the child has a good relationship with, mm. so that they can also make sense of the child's behavior in light of, you know, what's going on in, you know, in, in the child's life. So, for instance, if there, if there is a degree of regression in the child's behavior, or, you know, suddenly there are, you know, changes in their mood, you know, the mm. child is more withdrawn or is becoming more aggressive or mm. getting into trouble in the playground, actually that can be understood as a sign of distress mm. mm-hmm. rather than the child being, you know, suddenly naughty or, mm. you know, or misbehaving. And therefore adults can then respond to the behaviour with empathy, with compassion, you know, with mm. understanding, you know, that they all, you know, working towards the same goal, which is to, you know, to boost the child's resilience and help them, you know, manage a difficult and painful mm. situation and come out of that with more, you know, more resilience and, you know, mm-hmm. an insight. So, yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. You know, in, in the spirit of all working together mm-hmm. towards, you know, the same goal of supporting the child through a difficult mm-hmm. um, experience. And I guess with older children, you probably need to check in with them, don't you, before going to the school? I mean, mm-hmm. primary school children, you could see it feels a bit more of a no-brainer to go and talk to the, the class teacher or whatever. The structures are very different at secondary school and the relationships very. are very different. Yeah. And I'm yeah. just trying to think, you know, with my own, you know, with my own child, would I go to the school without talking to one of them for, you know, them first? I, I don't think I would. I think I'd need to get their, mm. you know, involvement probably. And you might do it with your, with the primary age child as well. You know, they, yeah. they, they, you know, it could be mm. something that is done, you know, kind of together so that they yeah. feel, you know, consulted in the process. And I'd, mm. I'd, I'd also, I would also say that with all the children and adolescents, there is something about the peer group you know, and the support yeah. that that kind of provides that can be a protective factor. So when thinking about resilience as well, you know, the, the resilience is boosted, you know, by safe, healthy kind of relationships, you mm-hmm. know, with key figures, you know, in our lives. Yeah. And, you know, that can be an adult, it can be a parent, it can mm-hmm. be a class teacher, it can be, you know, a family member, or it can be a peer, it can mm-hmm. be, you know, a friendship. So, you know, those relationships all play a key role in enabling children to, you know, to work through difficult experiences, mm-hmm. such as, their parents separation and divorce mm, mm. interestingly as well on that note in terms of young people who are adolescents in that teenage phase a lot of those adolescents in those same kind of quotes around what helped them through separation with their parents was people talking to them and respecting that they had a voice too and that right. you know um they wanted they know they couldn't make the decisions around what was happening but they wanted yeah. to be able to con- be consulted and to give their views on things and for people to actually ask their opinion and listen to them and I think that that's really important. I think just for them to have that space to know that, yes, we, we do want to hear what you have to say on this. And like, like Cecilia said, it, it, even with the primary school age child, it, they still should be offered that, that chance to mm. verbalise what they think or feel. Yeah, I think that's really important, isn't it? Because as the parents, it's really important to canvas their opinions, to get some feedback, to talk to them, to listen to them. But also you want to hold that space for them, don't you, where they don't need to feel the pressure of thinking they've got to, for example, choose between Mm. a parent in terms of where they're going to live, all that kind of stuff. Because that we hear that puts loads of pressure on kids and they don't want to upset either parent. So Mm. it's it's that it's a really sort of neat balance, isn't it, between being open and being able to listen and hear and be consultative but being really clear with them that the decision rests with you as the adults, not with them as the children, and that you Mm. want to protect them from feeling that they've got to make those choices or decisions. Mm. Mm. It's yeah. such a difficult balance to strike, isn't it? it? Is. Because as you said, yeah. you know, as adults, you know, going through a divorce, you know, you know, we're also suffering and mm. going through yeah. our own kind of grief process. And, you know, and, and we don't always get it right. No. You know, we don't always get it right, even when we, you know, we really, really want to protect our children. And and, and there is something about, you know, treating ourselves with compassion, mm. you know, and kindness and modeling that for our children. You know, mm. we're all trying our best, you know, we're suffering, you know, we need to acknowledge that and mm. look out for each other and ourselves and seek help if necessary. Mm. And again, you know, the ability to, you know, to, to put into words how we're feeling 
also is something that is proven to boost resilience mm. in by itself. Mm. So there's something for parents, and I'm hoping this is reassuring, you know, that when we're able to really listen to our children and stay with their experience without trying to fix it, mm. just literally being able to sit with the distress, with the, you know, with the pain, you know, with the anger, you know, with the anxiety, that in and by itself can make a huge difference. Mm. I think yeah. for a lot of us as parents, we feel under, you know, a tremendous amount of pressure to take the pain away, you know, mm. to make it all yes. better. Mm. And actually we can't. No. We can't, but what we That's can true. do, and it can be hugely therapeutic and, and helpful long term, is to model, as Judah was saying, you know, how to be with difficult feelings and mm. difficult, you know, life events, mm. knowing that we can survive them, you know, even though they're painful. Yeah. Yeah, because lots of the time as well, we don't, particularly in a divorce and separation, it might be a while before we have many of the answers. So we're having mm. to sit with that uncertainty. Yeah. And yes. sometimes it's very difficult. Parents want to wait till they've got all the answers before they open the dialogue mm. because mm. they don't want to be caught not knowing. And I, I can obviously understand that. But mm. I, I, I think you're missing a trick then, aren't you, if you're just waiting until it's all perfect because the chances yeah. of you yes. having a perfect set of information is so remotely small. Absolutely. I think you've just got to go and be brave and sit and be honest about the stuff that you don't know. And it is tricky because that's stressing in itself. And you know when you're trying to help a friend and sitting and talking with a friend, being there and being present with them, that can be really hard not to mm. jump into advice giving or anything else. So when it's your own child as well. Mm. It's so difficult. It's a big ask. Hard, very oh, hard. it's a big ask. It's very have- hard. We have all these shoulds as parents. I should be doing this. Mm. I should know what I'm doing. You know, mm. I should, the, 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 I should mm. be strong for my child. And mm. actually, you know, the, 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 you know, we're all, you know, struggling. And I think there mm. is something about modeling how to deal with, you know, how to be able to tolerate. You know, we, yeah. we just we just describe it. You know, the fact that sometimes yeah. we don't have all the answers. You know, we 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 have our own anxieties. You know, to mm. deal with. You know, we can deal with those difficult feelings as adults, mm. but also remain the parents. You yeah. know, keep the routine and get yeah, get our exactly. child to bed and get our yeah. child to do their homework. And, you know, yeah. and life stays, you know, has that kind of level of consistency, mm. which can be hugely helpful when there are times of transitions and upheaval. Yeah. But, mm. you yeah. know, that, that for, the, for children to have the reassurance that, yes, their life has changed, but many, many things also stay exactly the same. Mm. You know, they, they, mm. they still go to school. You know, they, they have their clubs. They mm. see their friends. Yeah. You know, they see their relatives, you know, mm. they, 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 they do their homework, yeah. you know, those, those things stay the same and the parents make sure those things stay the same mm. as much mm. as possible. Well, look, I can see that we're coming rapidly towards the end of time. I just wonder if we could just ask both of you just to, a couple of top tips for parents when you're going through divorce. What are the one or two things you can do just to recap to really support your child? So I guess the, the, the thing for me would be to just, um, like we've been talking about, just the normalising of the feelings that will happen for both of you and to be able to find a way of of dealing with that for yourself as the parent but also to give space for your child to express that and let that out and to know that that's okay to do but in the process to realize that you know that there is a process of you taking care of yourself through it and being compassionate to yourself and knowing that you know not everything you do throughout that will be perfect but you know you've got your child in mind and you will do the best job you can to get yourself and your child through that difficult process so I would just say, you know, it's, it's about just being compassionate to yourself around that whole process and allowing your child to yeah, have that space to go through that with you and see that you're, you're coping the best you can and they will cope the best they can as well. Thank you. And Cecilia, what about you? Anything to I add? I would say make sure you don't put your child in the middle. Right. You know, if you do nothing else, you know, make sure that you come to a good or as good as possible, a co-parenting arrangement with your ex-partner mm-hmm. where you are, even though you're not together, you know, that it, you are united in your commitment mm-hmm. to prioritise, you know, the security, you know, the safety and the well-being of your child. Mm-hmm. So that would be my first tip. Okay. And whenever possible, let your child continue to have a relationship with your ex if it is as all safe, because children that we work with tell us time and time and time again how much they want to keep a connection Mm. with either their mom or dad or the parent that they don't live Mm. with, how Mm. important that is to their, you know, to their emotional well-being. Okay. Well, that's really good advice to end on. Thank you. Um, How can people support Place to Be? So, as I said, we are a charity, so we're always very grateful for any support that people can offer. You can find out more about our work and make a donation via the Place to Be website. And for primary aged children, of the parents of primary aged children, you can or they can access our 
free resource for parents at parentingsmart.org.uk. It's a website full of advice and very practical tips for parents on common parenting challenges, including how to support your child when you're going through a separation and a divorce and advice on on co-parenting as well. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you, Cecilia. And where can people find out more about you? The best way to do that is to go on the place to be website. So place to be.org.uk. And Judah, same for you. Same for me. Yeah. 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 All right. That's brilliant. Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Of course, you can find out more about these podcasts by subscribing to the divorcepodcast.com. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Kate underscore daily. And you can follow Twitter to find out more about the next release of the podcast at divorce underscore podcast too. Thank you both very much. Thank you everybody for listening. Great to be here. Thanks, Kate. Thank you.